either ask the consent of the other party to do it later or make an application for court to uh, remove the bar. So now we get to plea. And this is now basically the defendant's first chance to um, you know, tell his side of the story. And this is his opportunity. And you do this in terms of Rule 18 and 22. As we said, 20 days after your notice of defense or 20 days after the declarations. It needs to, to comply with all those requirements we've already discussed. And if it doesn't, you can do an irregular step. Each paragraph contains a distinct averment. Um, and again, if you rely on a contract, then uh, you must attach it. And the plea must also be signed by the attorney and the advocate or the attorney with the right to appearance, as we discussed when we did the summons. In your plea, you can admit an allegation or you can deny an allegation or you can admit an allegation but add a justification. That's known as a confess and avoid. Um, and you can elect not to admit a material fact and state to what effect, but be very careful. In terms of Rule 33, if you do not deny or admit, then you deem to have admitted. I know sometimes we put in our pleas, the defendant notes this. This is not a denial or admission, and it will be deemed to be admitted. So be very careful. And also, if you say, I don't have any knowledge of this matter and cannot therefore de admit or deny, then deny it. Because if you say, I cannot admit or deny, because I don't know, it means you admitted it. So be very, very careful with your words. Be very clear that you admit or deny something, even if you don't know uh, what the matter is or you, or you don't know the facts. You can say, I don't know the facts, and therefore cannot admit or deny, but then deny it. I know we also like to say, uh, we deny the facts and put the plaintiff to the proof thereof. It's a bit of a tautology. If you deny, then obviously they have to prove it. I know we like to do that just to cover our butts. Not wrong, but doesn't take the matter further. Um, if you then have your um, claim in reconvention, you can ask for the plaintiff um, to uh, postpone the matter so that the matter can first be heard, the, the, the claim in reconvention can be heard. Um, this you can do even if the counterclaim is less than the ma main claim. And then also you can claim apportionment against plaintiff or any of the other joint, joint wrongdoers. Remember, that's when you've added the new joined, the new third party. So you can really, a lot of scope of, of what you can do with regard to the plea. So with the plea, we get this thing which we call a special plea. And that gets filed with the plea. It's not, it's, you can do it as a separate document. But you file it together with the plea. It doesn't You don't file the special plea the one day and the plea the other day. Uh, you have to do them together. But as I said, they can be separate documents. And what your special plea is, it doesn't raise a defense on the merits of the matter. You get two types. You get the stuff, the, the type of special plea that will just delay the matter. And you get the this, uh, type of special plea that will finalize the matter. So first one you get is, Les pendants. Who can tell me what Les pendants is? Oh, everybody's dead after lunch. Had too much to eat. It's already subject to another court case that's pending. Yes, there's another court case between the same parties and the same facts that is pending before court. So obviously then you have to stop this matter and the other matter first needs to be dealt with. Secondly, we have arbitration. Um, normally in our contracts, you, uh, you know, say no, the matter, uh, parties choose arbitration and the matter goes to arbitration first. So you need to finalize the arbitration. Obviously you, uh, you can take the arbitration on um, appeal or review. So if, if you're not happy, you can still do that, but you have to wait for the arbitration to be finished. And then the non-joinder, as we spoke earlier, so if you didn't join somebody, you now first have to join them before you can proceed. If we look at our final um, 
uh, interpleaders, uh, not interpleaders, sorry, special pleas. Um, first one is prescription. That is deadly um, because if it's prescribed, it cannot be revived. Um, so very important that you make sure that you're within the time you're supposed to be. Um, rest judicata, who can tell me what that is? Is it when the matter has already been settled um, by a competent court? No. Yes. yes. Um, um, so again, same parties, same matter. Court has already um, it adjudicated on it. So you can't can't do another forum. Sometimes people would go to the CCMA and they would go to court. You must choose your forum. You can't be in several forums at the same time, and you can't forum shop. So you need to finalize in whatever that forum is. And if you're not happy with the uh, result, you need to um, then go either the appeal or review or what other remedies you have in terms of where you are. Um, and then absence of jurisdiction. Remember, we spoke about it earlier this morning. The jurisdiction is very important. If the court does not have jurisdiction, it cannot help you. Um, so, Either you must have time to withdraw the matter and uh, institute action again. But remember, if you withdraw the matter in court, you have to tender costs. So if we get, say, for instance, to plea, quite a number of things have happened. So the cost could be quite high. And now you have to withdraw tender costs. And you can sue, but they can um, raise a defense to say previous costs have not been paid and then you stop again. So you'll need to pay that cost to really proceed. So again, obviously, client's not going to be happy if he now has to pay and he has to issue summons again. So this is why we kept on banging about jurisdiction earlier this morning. It's very important because it stops you dead if the court does not have jurisdiction. So please do your homework. Please make sure um, you are in the right jurisdiction. I had a matter the other day. Um, it was actually in the regional court, but they issued summons in the wrong court, uh, wrong jurisdiction, and I confirmed it with the court, and I confirmed it with the sheriff, and I confirmed it. Now it's the other court. And when I raised that as a special plea in my um, uh, plea, then my correspondent in the town phoned me and he said, but he doesn't understand why I'm raising the special plea, because the, this court has got jurisdiction. And so the people in working in that court also thought this court had jurisdiction over this place. And I showed him and I said, no, in terms of the government gazette, it doesn't. And he was quite shocked about it. So don't accept um, anybody telling you this court has got jurisdiction. Confirm it with another number of people. I normally, you phone the court, which you think has jurisdiction, and they say yes or no. And then you phone the other court, which might have jurisdiction as well, and they confirm it. And then just for good measure, you phone the sheriff as well. All right, so that they can tell you if they have jurisdiction to serve this matter, because usually the two um, jurisdictions overlap. Again, don't make the consumption that they do. There are some exceptions, but most of the time, the sheriff and magistrates court jurisdiction overlap. So make a hundred percent sure, and don't just you know confirm it to, with two or three other from two or three other sources, if at all possible. All right. Um, Okay, so this is where I wanted to, to plea on the declaration that you drafted earlier. So again, as I said, once you get your notes and once you get your answers, have a look at that, do it. Um, usually, sometimes not long, so you can be asked this in the exam. And, uh, you know, as I said, get into the drafting process. It, it takes a little bit of practice. And that's all you need, just practice. It's not do it. brain surgery. This feels like it sometimes. All right. Um, okay, counterclaim. Your counterclaim by the defendant, you have to do at the same time as the plea as well. Again, it can be a separate document, but you use you must do it at the same time. So you can have a special plea, plea and counterclaim as well. Um, same requirements as your declaration and all your other pleadings. 
and you get this thing that you call a conditional counterclaim. Anybody want to offer an explanation of what a counterclaim is, conditional counterclaim is? Hmm, talking Greek, Latin. Nobody. Okay. Oh, it's, it's like echoing. <laughs> it's like I'm talking in a cave. Um, all right. So, so if it's, in, it's mostly used by um, divorces. In South Africa, you, you have a no-fault divorce system. So if one party doesn't want to be married anymore, then you can ask for a divorce. But uh, the other party sometimes would say, well, the marriage has not irretrievably broken down. And as a result, um, I don't want to get divorced. But for in case the court says, well, all right, no, you, there is an irre irretrievable breakdown, you're going to get divorced, this is then my conditional counterclaim should the court find that there is grounds for us to get a divorce. And then you would put in a co conditional counterclaim. So you would um, use it in those circumstances. And then also after our big discussion with regard to joinder and um, third parties, you can add further plaintiffs with leaving the court here in the counterclaim and again if they haven't um uh, you know complied with the rules as we set out you can ask for the regular step proceedings in terms of rule 30. all right uh there are further pleadings we get the replication plea in reconvention rejoined the replication to the plea in reconvention so, uh, as I said earlier, you know, once you get here and you have to do these things, you, you know you're in trouble. Other than the plea and reconvention, which you need to, which the plaintiff needs to do on the counterclaim, the others really is there to fix up your plea and, and your, um, you know, if you, if you haven't done it right. So, we try not to get here, but there are opportunities, if necessary, for you then to, to deal with further uh, ways of explaining your plea or counterclaim. All right. Um, close appealings, pleadings. The parties have joined issue without adding further pleadings. Last day for replication or subsequent pleading has lapsed. It has not been filed. The parties agree in writing and file with registrar. And shockingly enough, the parties can't agree, then you can bring a court application. Um, it's important to realize when there's date is because, as I said, there are certain things that can only follow after the close of pleadings. So if the parties can't agree, I've never seen such an application. I don't, I don't think anybody's ever not uh, agreed with it. But, you know, sometimes people fight about everything. We are attorneys after all. So um, just remember, you can bring an application if the other party denies that the pleadings have closed. Okay, so we got various other matters, you know, options in, in the litigation process to try and settle the matter. This uh, Rule 34 deals with an offer to settlement. Now, this is a formal offer to settlement. I said earlier, you can settle whenever you want, and that's informal. As long as the two parties are happy or unhappy, as the case may be, to settle, um, that can be done. It can be made an order of court. But you can do a formal settlement in terms of Rule 34. And you can either offer money or performance. And the, t the performance can be done personally, or you can give a power of attorney for somebody else to do it. All these offers must be in writing. And you must say if the offer is unconditional or without prejudice. And we'll come back to why that's important. And it's important to you know that you can't pay into court. You used to be able to pay into court and then the money lies there and, and gets no interest. And then once the parties settle or the court makes an order, the other party could get the money immediately. Uh, that option is not available anymore. Um, I think it's probably safe for that way. So any party can basically offer to any other party. It's wide open, defendant can offer to the plaintiff, any party to other parties, several defendants to plaintiffs. So it's as wide as the sea. Any party can offer uh, to do anything for any other party. This notice of tender must go to all the parties and then you must state whether it's conditional or without prejudice. You must also indicate if you're going to pay costs, any or part of it, um, or maybe just the cost. 
um, or maybe saying, all right, you do, you do not want to pay costs and you must give reasons for that. Part, the action can be set down for the cost alone. So say the parties have settled on the capital amount, but they haven't decided on the cost yet, then they can go to court and, and the court can make a decision on the costs alone. The other party then can um, accept the offer within 15 days or by written consent. If, if they offer to do something, the registrar will over the, hand over the power of attorney. If you then fail to pay within 10 days, then you can apply for judgment. If the offer is without prejudice, then there's no record in the court file. So the judge doesn't know about it. If then you go to court, um, the court makes a judgment and the uh, offer that was made is then uh, the same or less. I must just always think. Then um, you don't you you don't have to pay the cost. Or no, you have to pay the cost because you didn't accept it. All right. So let's just go back there. Um, you can bring the uh, offer to the notice of the court. Uh, with regard to costs after judgment and if you don't bring it to the court's attention then in, within five days you can ask for costs uh, reconsidered all right but any party who discloses a without prejudice offer to court shall be liable for the cost even if he's successful and you can use this in motions and claims and reconvention all right so the the uh, what can I say, the, the, the good part about this application or, or this way. So if you put in your claim and say, for instance, the claim is a million rand, you offer to pay 500,000 rand. The court says no, or, or the other party says, no, I'm not accepting it. Let's go to trial. We go to trial. The court orders that you then pay 500,000 or less. Then the party that didn't accept your order is only entitled to his costs up until the date that the offer is made all right if the court says no you must pay seven hundred thousand then the, the other party is entitled to to his full costs because now you, the court said you must pay more than you offered so that is the um what can happen with regard to the settlement and what sometimes again uh, strategically good to make the decision to make such an offer especially if you've got an applicant uh, a, a, a plaintiff that doesn't want to settle because he's not going to be able to get his cost. So if you make your offer early on, even before plea, and he doesn't accept it and we get to trial, then he's not entitled to any of the costs with regard to the trial. And you know, with SCs, you pay a lot of money. Well, ad advocates in general, but um, who wants to tell me what they think in SC charges per day? 40,000 rand. 40,000. 40, Gosh, that's a cheap SC. Where can I get him? Maybe SC, class. senior counsel, you're looking at 100,000 rand a day. Juniors, senior juniors, junior seniors, they charge 40, 30 to 40,000 rand a day. So you can just imagine if you're looking at a five day trial and you have a senior and a junior, you're looking at 500,000, 600,000, and that's just your, your advocate fee, then you're not even talking about the attorney's fees and, and preparation and so on. So you can see sometimes the costs are horrendous. Um, a year or two ago, there was a, um, a court case here in Cape Town. It was a divorce matter. At, at the I think it was a defendant. I'm assuming it was the defendant. Was an SC from Johannesburg and his wife was sued him for divorce. First thing is that um, in his ANC, he had a stipulation to say that should uh, the matter go to divorce, she is not allowed to ask for maintenance. So he had her renounce her right to maintenance. Court said no. Contra bonus mores, not allowed to do that. So invalid, so that part of the um, ANC was struck off. This matter, this matter ran for 50 
court days. All right? So you can just imagine how long that took. 50 court days. I mean, that's horrendous. Can you imagine? And, and both sides had SEs and juniors. At the end of the day, uh, the court found against him and ordered him to pay the cost. He did take it on appeal and he did claw back some of the cost, but still not all of it. So can you imagine? So I'm just showing to you or illustrating to you how horrendous the cost can be. Um, and it really is very few people. It's the, it's the, as I said, the pro bono people and the very rich people that can really afford to litigate. Anybody in between cannot afford to litigate. I mean, I cannot pay my own sell my own fees if I have to litigate. So I can't afford myself. Um, so it's very expensive. So that is why I'm saying to you all the time, you can use costs to your advantage because it's so expensive to settle the matter. It's unfair and it's probably, you know, when you think about it, everybody should have access to justice. But in reality, only the very rich and the very poor. Okay. Let's get away from this Neg uh, negative sentiments. Uh, second option or second um, yeah, option that there is is interim payments. So this is for damages claims only. So your uh, RAF matters and your medical malpractice matters, personal injuries or death. And you can only claim for medical costs or loss of income. Um, it's in terms of rule six, it's your normal rule six application and your affidavit must contain the amount of damages, grounds for application, documentary proof must be attached. Um, it will only be granted if your defendant admitted liability or the plaintiff has judgment and the defendant must have insurance for a claim or able to afford it. As soon as the um, defendant is indigent, you can't get such an order. Um, if you get an interim order, again, it must cannot be disclosed to court. Um, and the, what happens is the court may grant or refuse the, the um, claim and then they have to pay back the money. All right. This, again, applies to reconvention. Let me just give you an example where this was used. Um, this is the matter of Nyati versus the Minister of, uh, I think it was Health in Gauteng. Mr. Nyati, um, somebody threw paraffin, uh, paraffin over him and, and set him alight for no reason. He was then taken to hospital. They put an intravenous line incorrectly into his arm. And as a result, he suffered seizures and he couldn't work anymore. His wife then had to stop working as well because she had to look after them. They both had decent jobs um, and four little children. They then instituted action against uh, the minister, as I said, of the Provincial Health Administration. And after a while, they admitted liability, but they didn't want to pay the amount. And we're not talking, I think it was 1.2 million if it's a couple of years ago now, so it's it's not a horrendous amount. They refused to then, uh, you know, they had a dispute, dispute about the amount. Uh, yes, you know, obviously these people have no income. Um, they're living on charity and um, can't work. And finally, um, they then went to attorneys able to assist them and I brought an application in, in terms of this rule for interim payment of, uh, you know, the, the costs. Of, of the medical expenses. And it wasn't opposed. The state attorney didn't turn up. The court granted it. Now, in those, now we're talking 2012, round right about there. That State Liability Act that we spoke about earlier this morning when we spoke about the state, uh, the, the Institute of Action Against State Organs, that act actually um, stipulated that even if you have judgment against the state, you are not allowed to execute against the state. So even though you have judgment, you cannot go and attach goods in terms of that act. And so they got the judgment and they could do nothing with it. 
they went back to court again, brought another application, say, look, we got the judgment, we must pay. Again, court said, yes, state must pay. Didn't do anything, couldn't execute. So finally, their last option was then to bring an application to declare those sections. It was section three of the State Liability Act unconstitutional because they're saying you can't have a judgment from court and not execute it. Then it means nothing. And then the court said, yes, you're correct. Those are unconstitutional. So um, you can execute against the court. But that was the high court. And because it was a declaration of inconstitutionality, I had to go to the constitutional court to be confirmed. Matter was heard before the constitution. Now you must remember these things take time. All right, it doesn't happen overnight. Appeared in front of the constitutional court, all 13 judges climbed down on the poor state attorney and just said to them, you pay. Before this matter go anywhere, and we look at the invalidity of the declaration, you must pay. And um, unfortunately, Mr. Nyati then died. So before he got any money, he died. Uh, eventually the state did pay and the constitutional court confirmed the invalidity of that section. And now you will note that you can execute against the state. You just have to comply with a lot of requirements. You have to give notice and things like that. But um, eventually, if they don't pay, you can execute them and you will, you will note um, the RAF, you know, they're attaching a lot of, oh, that's not state, but still, you know, they're attaching a lot of computers and things. Um, so keep that in mind, especially if you want to execute against the, the state, you can, but you need to um, just require, make, uh, comply with certain requirements and those are set out in your state liability act. But this is what happened, you know, with the interim payments. So you can do it um, and hopefully people will then pay. All right. Um, all right, so now we get to discovery. As I said to you, it's a very useful tool um, because now you sit down and you see what the other party is going to bring and show in court and how they're going to prove their case. And you're going to sit down and you have to figure out, okay, what do I have to prove my case? How I'm going to prove it. Remember what I said, attorneys, we like paper. Um, however, with regard to the way we communicate these days, obviously this has changed quite a bit. We don't write letters anymore to each other that gets posted and you fight about if you received it or not. We don't really do faxes anymore. Most people either by, uh, communicate by way of email, WhatsApps, you know, whatever forum you use. And so the question then arises, are you entitled to um, discover these electronic communications that we have. And you will note that in the High Court, um, Rule 35 makes provision um, of documents and tape recordings. And then Rule 23 of the Match Court, they've extended it um, and referred to electronic, digital, or any other form of recordings. And all of this can be discovered. Um, and this uh, is a well-known case. This is our um, Please Call Me um, case, McCarty versus Vodacom, where Mr. McCarty is asking a lot of money for from Vodacom. And in terms of this act, um, um, case, um, the court has interpreted Rule 35 to cover data stored on databases that are retrievable by, data, uh, retrievable by data searches. So all electronic communications can be made available um, for uh, discovery and you can ask for it. Now, uh, this is not really a technical um, lecture, it's a high court lecture, but I want to just discuss various technical things with you because I think it's important that we know about it, that one, the way we communicate, um, we must realize what the consequences are and it can be discovered and then also know that you can ask for it to be discovered. If you're a technical fundi, I apologize if this is very basic to you. Um, but I just need to explain this to our people, uh, includes me, that do not know all these technical technicalities. So we get um, hidden data or information associated to electronic data, which we are allowed to ask for. And they, we get three different ones. There's metadata, residual data, or replicant data. Uh, metadata basically is... Um, the 
recording on the system about a particular document. So the format, how, when, and by whom it was created, saved, assessed, or modified. Um, for example, most word processing programs, um, you created a document, but then also saved the time um, when the document was revised. Most email records would also have the dates and times the emails was created and sent, as well as the names that are included in the blind copy. Now, so you sometimes maybe want to have that information to see who they sent that email to. So who's involved in this matter could give you a lot of information. <clears throat> All right. um, so normally you don't see it, but it's easy to obtain. Um, and you can get it if you do a printout of the record um, of the document, um, you would be able to get, obtain this, this information quite easily. So please remember, uh, if you know, especially if the document gets changed quite a bit, people would be able to access it and they would be uh, entitled to request that information. Uh, residual data. Okay, this is um, the information that remains stored on a computer after the document has been deleted. Now, uh, if you think that deleting a document gets rid of it and it's not on the um, computer anymore, I've got bad news for you. You need to um, wipe it clean and you need to have a specific um, programs to do it. Um, computers aren't logical. So they don't save, if, you, if you're busy with, with your Word document one, two, three, and you change it and you save it over it, it doesn't save over the same place on the disk. It saves at different places. So it, it only literally goes away if you save over it and you can't tell it when to save over it. It chooses by itself when to save over a document. So once um, you saved over a document, the previous version could still be around and you would be able to retrieve that. Um, it's not easy to see because the tags get, um, you know, wiped away. But please remember, and, you know, and you've seen it on television, you know, when you go to um, CIS or one of those programs, they always get information. I mean, the whole disk is destroyed, but this one little piece, and on this one little piece, they get the most important information, which breaks up in the case. And it's because things don't get destroyed, unless you give it to a 13-year-old boy, and that will destroy the hard drive for you completely. So keep that in mind. Um, all right, so as we say, so I think something needs to be saved over quite a number of times and you get programmed to do it for you, but it can be forensically retrieved if needs be. Replicant data um, is the backups. You know, Word makes every now and again, you see there at the bottom, it says making a backup. And um, those backups, they also, again, don't go over the same place. So the one backup doesn't necessarily wipe out the other backup. So each time the program creates a new backup file um, and then the previous backup file is still around and they would be able to retrieve it. Okay, so please just keep these things in mind as the way that we communicate changes and the way that we get documents. It's not also necessarily just paper. Uh, you need to be able to ask for the electronic data and you're entitled to ask for it. But also keep in mind when you communicate with people and you send through an email with a document attached, a lot of these inform this information actually goes with that document and the other side will be able to access it if they want to. So you ask for your uh, discovery within 10 days, uh, 20 days of your close of the pleadings. Um, and then they reply by way of affidavit. And as I said, those of you that have drafted it would know that it's such a fun process, but it's very important. Um, and you sit down and you figure out how you're going to do your case. And uh, if you do not discover a document after being asked to discover, you're not allowed to use that document. So as I said, it's not like in television or movies where they just, here yeah, at the end somewhere, suddenly, you know, pull out this very important document that proves everything. And if they haven't given it to the other side or disclosed it, you are not allowed to use it. So there's no surprises in our legal system. You need to tell the other party what they expect and what they're going to get. Um, if you uh, don't get what you want, again, you can ask to compel. Um, you can, especially with RAF and state and sessionary matters, you can ask for discovery against the driver or the owner 
or the Zidane, so it gives you wider power. I want to just show you what the process is like. So firstly, we have our notice of discovery. You then have 20 days to do your discovery affidavit. After that, at any time, the other party can then request an inspection. So once you have your list of documents, I know the practice is we usually ask for copies and we, and we tender the cost of the copies. But you must always remember that some copies, you know, can cut off at the bottom, important things, or they might be written something at the back, which they don't copy for you, or you might have something written in pencil and pencil doesn't copy. So best practice is go and inspect the originals if you can. All right. So you're then entitled after you got your discovery document uh, affidavit to ask to go and inspect the documents. You ask that and they must answer you within five days. And then within five days, the other party must come back to you and say, right, um, yes, the times, which is from eight o'clock to five o'clock, and it is for five days. So they will give you a week. They say you can come next week, Monday to Friday from nine to five in the office, and then you can come and inspect inspect the documents so I would suggest that you make use of that especially you know if you're dealing with big cases lots of money involved it's amazing sometimes what you can pick up from originals which is not available you know you can't you couldn't see on copies so uh, very good process this to figure out what's happening um, you know document wise and what they're going to use against you um, as I say, if they don't discover, then you can compel them. And if they don't um, come back, you can dismiss the claim. You can ask for specific documents, um, especially if they referred to it previously, then you can ask for it. Um, very important that you must make sure that it's again not a fishing expedition, that you must make you must make the allegation that they are in the process the possession of the document. If, uh, if not, again, they can, you know, get cost against you. Usually in our notices, we would then say, um, you know, if you produce this document at court, you don't have to prove um, that this person drafted it and that it's the original. If it's the document it purports to be, then it will be accepted. Um, if you referred in, 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 say, for instance, uh, affidavits, summary judgment affidavits or pleadings, you refer to a document, and you didn't deliver it, then it can be asked um, that that document be discovered. And as I said, if they if they didn't ask you for, to discover, then you don't have to, and you can use whatever documents you want. But if you were asked to discover and you didn't, then you're not allowed to use those documents. All right, and again, this is available for applications, but you need to get the court's consent. All right, you need to apply to court if you want to have discovery in applications. Usually that's not necessary because the point of applications is that you case is in paper so everything is attached. Um, but you you can ask for discovery if need be. Same um, option with further particulars. All right. So there's two two times you can ask for further particulars. Firstly is just after your notice of defense in terms of Rule 35 and you need that for the purpose of pleading very important it's not a fishing expedition you can't just go and say i want everything you need to say these documents you must clearly specify which documents you must make the allegation that it's in the other party's possession and that it's relevant to the uh, issue in action um, remember it is um, essential and not useful. That is the test. So it must be essential to the matter, not useful. And if you don't comply and you don't provide the further particulars, you can bring an application to compel and you might even be able to dismiss the matter. In terms of Rule 21, you can also ask um, for further particulars. So what we said is that your pleading should contain sufficient detail. If not, then you can um, have an exception or irregular proceedings. Now, if, if that wasn't done, um, then after close of pleadings, you can then ask for further particulars necessary for trial. Um, and that must comply 10 days with, an, with uh, receipt of that. However, the court will mirror motor, that means out of its own, whether it was necessary for these further particulars and allow cost accordingly. 
And that's why I said earlier, if we don't use the exceptional regular uh, proceedings to clarify the uh, pleadings, when you then come here and you want to ask further particulars, the court might say to you, you know what, you should have sorted it out with an exception or regular proceedings. I'm not going to assist you now. So it's a fine line. Okay, so when you, that's why I said in the beginning, um, when you make decisions as if you want to do exception or regular proceeding, you need to take into consideration that the court might have you later on if you don't do it. Okay, pre-trial of procedures. I'm, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail. Please, when you have a trial, I would suggest that in the front cover of your file, you... Um, set out your date and you start with okay this is my trial date when not when the trial is going to happen and then you work back because there's very specific time frames in which you have to do your inspections you have to give notice of your plans and photograph uh, photographs expert witnesses you need to give notice that you're going to do an expert witness you need to give a summary of what the expert notice is going to say all those things are very strict um timelines so work them back from your date of trial and if you have it in your in the front of your file and as the date might change or the circumstances change you, you have to adapt your date but please diarize them please don't um be late because that can obviously again be used again and we now at the trial tail end if i could call it that of our procedure we are on our way to litigation so the chances are that that you know this will be used against you if you don't do it within time if, if um you don't do the expert the summaries you're not going to be allowed to call them so uh, make sure that you comply with this and make sure that you um, do the necessary notices as required. Okay, we'll skip that one. All right, so court notice, the practice notes, all right. Uh, collate, number consecutively, suitably secure. So indexing pagination, um, very important as I've said before make sure that everything is um, easy accessible for the judge make sure you can turn the pages um i once was in a court uh, matter where i was put everything into leverage files and i made sure everything was lovely and beautiful for the judge and the day we appeared in court i'm looking at these files and i'm like this is not our files so it was one of the uh, you know when these firms that have the name of the firm emblazoned in gold on the outside of the um, Liberoch file, but unfortunately they used old ones. And so the, um, what can I call them, the tongs did not align. So every time the judge paged, the page would get stuck. And by tea time he was very irritated. And he said, please sort out these files. He said, you can't turn the page because every time he turns the page, it gets stuck and he has to free it. And so the uh, poor little candidate attorney had to run around getting new files and put them in, in the file. So obviously I'm just telling you, I was very um, happy because it wasn't us and us because our files were nice and um, they tried to be cute and made the judge unhappy. So <laughs> needless to say, they lost the case. But in any event, I wouldn't say it was just that, but <laughs> it might have played a role. So please keep that in mind. Make sure that you know the judges are happy and they can turn the pages and they can read everything is in order and in sequence. Um, all right. So your your date gets allocated by the registrar and you get notified by it. As I said in in the Western Cape, we do have our pre trials and and they will not allocate you a court date unless the judge certifies that the matter is trial ready. So you first have to go through that process and once that's done and uh, they will then allocate a trial date. Um, and at the moment in the Western Cape, um, you're looking at very long delays. I, I think it's even worse now with COVID. So previously it was about, once you're done and your pleadings have closed, you, you wait about two or three years before you get a date. So it's probably longer now. Um, so it's unfortunately an extremely long and drawn out process, which you need to warn your client about. And it's also important then that you have as much even, um, evidence before the time when it's still fresh in the minds that you uh, get evidence and do affidavits and things like that because three or five years down the line they're not going to remember anymore uh, difficult um, not much we can do about it this is better than India which is down from 20 years to 10 years for a civil trial so you know they're progressing slowly but surely um, okay so this is as I said this is our pre-trial conference uh, you need to fill in the form. There is a, a form in terms of Rule 37, and 
the judge, as I said, will certify once the matter is trial ready. Again, um, this is our practice now. Please look at this. Um, I, I'm not sure if this is still used, especially now with COVID. Um, so make sure, speak to the judges, registrar, they're going to deal with it. Because unfortunately, as I said, things are a bit topsy-turvy at the moment. But other than that, make sure that you read the trial, the practice notices and you know what you're supposed to do. Um, okay, these are just short questions with regard to um, high court practice. Um, so briefly explain what requirements are for, for requesting further particulars in the high court and at what stage of the proceedings these may be requested. Who can remember? We just did it. Who am I waking you up? Hello. No, nope. nope. nobody there. Nobody. Is, it, is it at the discovery stage uh, where you have to specify exactly which documents you need so you can't just, as you mentioned, go on a fishing expedition, you have to um, specify exactly which documents um, and so that, that's the discovery stage, Rule 3514. Um, you can also do it in terms of Rule 21 um, with regards to the pleadings, if the pleadings don't display the full particulars there. Okay. Um, half right. You ask before you plea, but you, you don't have to do it. The discovery is, is a separate process. Discovery, it's not for further particulars. You Further particulars are separate from discovery. Discovery, you need to say which documents I'm going to use. And yes, it usually is a surprise or you might learn things, but it's not necessarily for the particulars. You can ask for further particulars then to prepare for trial. All right, so those are our two options. Um, all right. Name three instances when pleadings are considered closed in the High Court. See, that's an easy question. One is, is very easy. What happens if you can't agree? If the parties can't agree, what do you normally do? Yes, Kenneth. You resume with the trial. Do you go to trial? Now you bring an application to court to declare that pleadings have closed. All right, so that's one. What other two instances is pleadings closed? Uh, how about Shini? Is it when the time to file your application um, has expired? Yes, that's right. Yes. Yeah. So the time uh, when the last pleading had to be done, that's expired and no pleading is coming, then um, pleadings are closed as well. All right. So, see, easy. All right. The other, there's, other, there's two others. All right. Um, is it when the parties agree in writing? Yes, they can agree to it in writing as well. Quite correct. Okay, see, easy peasy. All right, so, you know, you've gone through this whole process now, you know, and you've won, and the client's happy, and you all go for dinner or lunch or whatever. Advocate takes you to lunch. because are happy you're paying. <laughs> and uh, now the other side comes, and they're not happy. Or you might have lost, and your client's not happy. What options do we have? Okay. So we have appeals and review. 
Okay, we're going to just look at the appeals now. This is in, and remember, you, when you do magistrate's court, um, you get an appeal from the magistrate's court to the high court. That's automatic. You don't have to ask for leave to appeal. However, in the high court, if you want to go further to appeal, you must ask for leave to appeal. Now, so you can ask when the judge gives judgment, you can immediately ask for the judge to give leave to appeal and, and you would not be popular because obviously the judge would want you to go and read the judgment first, get some instructions before you start running to court. You have 15 days from judgments or reasons given to then apply for leave to appeal and the grounds obviously must be indicated. And you have to do that uh, with a judge that presided at trial. Um, if you appear in the high court, in the, if the high court is your court of first instance, so either a summons or application, that would be heard by a single judge. If you then want to appeal, you have to go either to a full court or the Supreme Court of Appeal. Full, all right, come back to that. Um, very important, your threshold for granting leave to appeal. When you read cases about appeal, you would see that it is a reasonable prospect that another court might come to a different conclusion. That was the old test. In, in terms of the act, new act, you need to say that it's more than a mere possibility of success. So the prospect of success on appeal and that those prospects are not remote, but have a realistic chance of succeeding. So the, the threshold is higher than mere prospect of success. All right. So please keep that in mind, especially when you read cases that refers to appeal, because a lot of your cases, all the cases will then refer to a reasonable prospect where it is not all right, it must be more than a mere possibility of success. All right, so you then apply for leave to appeal to the single judge to appeal the matter either to the full court or the Supreme Court of Appeal. If she or he or she refuses leave to appeal, you can then apply to the Supreme Court for leave to appeal. Okay, it's not appeal yet, you're still asking for leave to appeal. All right. And that must be done within one month after the leave was refused. Um, if leave was ever granted, then you can do your notice of appeal within 20 days. You must indicate if you are appealing against the whole of the judgment or just part of it. Uh, I've got Kelsey. Got a question? Erasmus? Yes? Okay, I'm not sure she's put up a hand. I'm not sure why. Okay, another hand. How about she? Sorry, someone else's mic is also on. Yeah. The what is also on? Alison Bevis' mic is on. Oh. Okay. Sorry. Um, okay, let me just mute everybody. All right. We've muted everybody, so. Okay. All right. Um, and then also you must indicate if you're um, appealing against the facts, uh, findings of fact, or the rulings of law, you can do both. But you need to then indicate it's a fact and law. Right. You can only appeal against a judgment or an order. So say, for instance, you're bringing an in interlocutory application. Normally, you would not be able to appeal against that because it's not final. It's not the end of the matter. To give you an example with rescission of judgment, if you're the applicant and rescission was granted, the respondent can't appeal against that because the matter's not finalized. You're still going to go on trial and the court might still make a decision in favor of the respondent. 
However, if you, the applicant, brought an application for rescission of judgment and that is denied, it's the end of the matter and you cannot proceed. You're entitled to appeal that judgment. All right, so just to indicate to you what final means. Um, so the court has said it's a final effect, it's got a definitive of the rights of parties and it deposes a substantial portion of the relief. If it has no practical effect, then the court will not listen to it. It's not going to do academic questions. We spoke about that matter earlier this morning for, of the Legal Aid Board. That was really an academic um, judgment because there was nobody was involved anymore, but the court was willing to assist the Legal Aid Board just to clarify the law. So they, they have the discretion to do that. Um, and then very important, your order is suspended. The operation of your order is suspended when an appeal is noted. You can bring an application um, for that to be executed, but uh, normally the court doesn't like to, to uh, grant that. All right, if you want to apply for appeal to the Constitution Court, we're coming back to our Constitution 17th Amendment Act, and what the court requires is that the matter raises an arguable point of law of general public importance, which ought to be considered by the court. So the, it's, a, it's a further requirement than we have with regard to the prospect of, you know, that it must be, there must be a, a very good reason or, or prospect of success. And then if you want to go to the Constitutional Court, you've got this additional requirement that the matter raises an arguable point of law of general public importance. All right. And you need to also ask leave on the Constitutional Court. All right. So this is the spider's web. Okay, let me explain to you. So we've got the Magistrates Court here. So let's say we started in the Magistrates Court. We will now want to appeal the Magistrates Court decision. We don't have to get permission. And once we appeal, we appear in front of two judges. All right. If we want to appeal those two judges, all right, we need to ask for leave to appeal to the Supreme Court of Appeal, not to those two judges, all right. If you appeared in the High Court and your judge, you just had one, normally you just have one judge, sometimes the JP can say this is an important matter, let's go here in front of two, three judges, but normally once your court of first instance is the high court, you appear in one court, uh, one judge. If you then want to appeal that judgment, you need to get leave to appeal from this judge. All right? And then you can either appeal to three judges or the Supreme Court of Appeal. If this one judge denies the leave to appeal, you need to apply to the Supreme Court of Appeal for leave to appeal. All right. If you appeared in front of three judges and you want to appeal that, you ask for the leave of appeal for the three judges. And then obviously you're going to ask for leave to appeal to the Supreme Court of Appeal. If that gets denied, the leave to appeal, you ask the Supreme Court of Appeal for leave to appeal. And then the Supreme Court of Appeal can make a decision. Either you go back, to, uh, if it was in front of one judge, you can go to three judges or you can go directly to the Supreme Court of Appeal. And if anywhere from here you want to go to the Constitutional Court, you need to ask permission from the Constitutional Court for leave to appeal. Okay, so please be aware that the, the requirements from two judges is different from the uh, requirements of one judge or three judges, because you need leave to appeal from the Supreme Court of Appeal. Clear as mud. You understand that? Must I must I explain that again? No, we understand. Yeah, all right, good. All right. Um, just for in case you didn't know, there's a difference between a full bench and a full court. So a court of a division consisting of two judges is known as a full bench. But a court consisting of three judges is a full court. All right. 
<laughs> I must say to you, that's something I learned. I didn't know that. So full bench, full court, not the same thing. Full bench, two, two judges, full court, three judges. All right. Okay, now I have to draft it. Now you don't have to know it. So we're not drafting. Again, this is also um, a favorite exam question. So practice it. Make sure you'll be able to do it. Okay, so um, this is just breakdown of the appeal. So I'm going to go through this quite quickly. Please, when you do an appeal, make sure your time frames are correct. The appeal court is full of nonsense. If you think the high court is nonsense, the appeal court is three times worse. Make sure that you comply with your time limits. They don't give um, condemnation easily. You can ask, but they don't like it. Um, I and comply. You'll see when we get there. That again, there's a lot of um, requirements with regard to the typing and the binding. Make sure that you comply with it. The registrar is full of nonsense. They don't accept if it's not right. And especially, I mean, if you're coming from Cape Town, you send things up. It's not that easy to fix it. You can't quickly run to the office and fix it. Things need to be, you know, sent up with couriers and. So need, give yourself enough time to make sure that you comply with things and make sure that you comply with it correctly. Um, so we're looking at um, Rule 49 and then again your consolidated practice notes. If to ask for leave to appeal, you will um, what you will do is do your notice, all right? And then you will arrange with the um, registrar and the other party to appear before the judge. So that would not go through either of the registrar. The judge would then determine their own date when you argue for leave to appeal. Usually it's done um, before court. It's heard, say, at about half past um, nine. So you really have a very short time to bring an application. It's not long arguments. You're not rehashing the old arguments. You need to show now why you're entitled to leave to appeal. They normally give judgment immediately. Or, or maybe shortly afterwards. So you, you get that judgment for leave to appeal quite quick. Um, if the um, applicant, and remember now, once yeah, it's still applicant for then not arrange with the date with the judge, the respondent can do it because remember now everything is suspended and now they're not doing anything. The respondent can then arrange and go to the judge um, if the applicant doesn't do it. If leave is then granted, you now become the appellant. There's a slight change of, of, of phrasing there, of, of, and, and the respondent stays the respondent, but the applicant now becomes the appellant. Um, you can do a cross appeal, the respondent, um, you know, and give notice of that. Um, once you've arranged uh, your date, it's 60 days after your notice of appeal, you get your date. Um, and again, if the appellant doesn't do it, the respondent can apply for the date. Um, unfortunately, now we also have to kill some trees. Um, three copies of the of the record goes to the registrar plus your index, um, and then also two copies goes to the respondent. So it's five copies: three copies to the judges, two copies to. Um, you know, go to the to the other side. Yasmin, have you got an a question? Uh, Ma'am, I just want to ask: um, Will there be a break anytime? Because um, I just needed to, to do something really urgent, so I don't want to also just miss out on class. I was just wondering if we are going to get an hour break or what? Um, yeah, we might have a little break. Um, we, we're not far from finished. Um, so I don't know how, how does the class work. Shall we push to finish? Yeah. Okay. All right. Not too long. In well, you know, another say half an hour or so. All right. Um. Okay. Security. Very important. Did you need to lodge security? It's not a lot. I think it's like a hundred rand or something ridiculous. So we're not talking millions. Um. All right. Very important, and as I said, give a lot of copies. Um, give your notice. If you don't do it within those times, your appeal lapse. 
all right, and then they, they can proceed with the judgment to enforce it. Um, your registrar gives you your date. Again, you do heads of argument, court succinct points. Um, with, remember with your list of authorities, always important to do your list of authorities. If, especially if you refer to unreported cases, make sure that you can provide the court with copies of it. Uh, usually with reported cases, uh, they might be able to access it, but I make a bundle of, of um, authority in any event. Just so that, again, you're making life easier for them. If they want to look at the court case, they have it. They don't have to go look it up. So even though it's a lot of paper, provide them with a bundle of authorities. You see now here we are, again, with our requirements, clear type for pa paper, double spacing, every tenth line on each page is numbered. That's just a new requirement, so you actually have to count them. It's very exciting. They need to be bound, um, easiest you know, for them to turn. And again, you have your margin of 3.5. So you see where your margin comes from um, because they need to make, if, if you bind it, there must be enough space for binding and for, for you to, to read. You don't want to cut off your sentences. So if we go to the SCA, so we go there when leave to appeal was um, refused by the High Court. You're asking for leave to appeal um, of the appeal, basically, and then leave to appeal against judgments uh, from two judges and an appeal against the judgment of the full bench. Then you would uh, go to the appeal and ask for, for leave there. Um, you make an application to the Chief Justice, you leave to appeal, and then you're heard by two judges, um, and then they can either grant or refuse um, the, uh, you know, the application. If the court then, um, you know, grants it, you need to add three copies. Uh, no, or, or, no, sorry. If they, if they refer this back to the court, then you, they, you normally you don't go to court, the SCA, to be heard for leave to appeal. They just do it on the papers. If they want you to go to court, you need to add another three copies um, to be given to the judgments of your application for leave to appeal. You don't attach the record, it's served on the mat, on the respondent, but you must also attach a copy of the order appealed against, a copy of the order refusing leave to appeal, a copy of the judgment of the court of quo, and a copy of the judgment of the refusal of leave to appeal. Now, please make sure that you realize that these are different. The copy of the order, the order is typed by the um, typist, it's just usually your one page, uh, which says action, uh, you know, or dismissed and with costs or action, whatever. That would be your order. Um, and then your judgment would be the pages that the judge wrote and normally be a couple of pages. So that's what you get from the judge. The other day I spent two days sitting in high court now during this COVID time to get court orders. Um, it's, and I've explained to the uh, to the Supreme Court of Appeal, sorry, I can't get access, they don't allow us, they don't care. So I had to get special permission to go into court, physically go into court, get the court orders, and it took me two days. It was horrendous. But in any event, so please make sure that you have enough time to get this because it takes some time for it to get typed, um, and sometimes you have to struggle to get it. So make sure that you have enough time to do it. Um, all right, the so SCA, I'm not going to go through a lot of these time frames. I'm not going to remember it. But when you do it, make sure, as I said, that you comply with them and that you um, appoint a correspondent in, in, in Bloemfontein. They know the ins and outs. They usually have people that are specifically designed just to do appeals. Um, and they know the ins and outs and what the requirements are. Because let me just tell you something. If you think these are the only requirements, I've got bad news for you. They have these unwritten requirements as well. For instance, they want six CDs of the record. There's no way in the rules or the practice notes. That you find out because your correspondent tells you they want CDs. And I was very upset. So I'm like, where does it stand? No, no way. But you must get the CDs. So unfortunately, there are, there are unwritten rules as well when you go to the ECA. Um, um, when you appear, yeah. you need to go into, there's five judges, all right? 
usually um, you just go introduce yourself to the senior judge because there's too many and, and they will accept everybody and you arrange before that time to go and see them. I know now with COVID, they are also doing um, the court by teams. So you actually physically don't go there, which I think is a good idea because we went up for an appeal once and luckily we argued for three quarters of an hour. So now, you know, you fly up from Cape Town, you have to do it the night before because there's only two flights to Cape Town. There's probably less now, Ach, to Bloemfontein. Accommodation for the one night. Argue there for three quarters of an hour and then come back. So the expenses are horrendous for such a short um, period that you argue. So I actually think it's probably more cost effective the way they're dealing with it now. So I'm not sure if they'll keep going with that after COVID, um, but it might not be a bad idea. Um, all right. If it's the, the difference between appeal and review, very important. So appeal, you've got a particular period of time. Review, they only ask a reasonable time. The appeal, you're bound by the record. The review, you're not bound by the record. Um, in appeal, there's a wrong conclusion on the facts or law. and the review, you've got a limited ground for review. Please... Um, Take note of this. This is also a favorite question in the exam, which they like to ask the difference between an appeal and review. All right. When we do applications, we'll have a look at review. All right. Okay. So sometimes, you know, you get the judgment. You're not going on appeal, but you're still not getting paid. So sometimes the execution process is longer than the... Um, you know, the, the the court case and the litigation and, and getting there. So client obviously is not very happy, but this is the only way you're going to get your money. So in the high court, you get a warrant of execution. You do not get your Section 65 procedure, your emolument attachment order, your garnish order. You don't get that. Um, if you want to do that, you can bring down um, the, the judgment from the high court to the magistrate's court in terms of 65M, if I remember correctly, but I can just tell you now, nobody knows what you're talking about when you want to do that. So it's a bit of a struggle, but you are allowed to do that to bring that judgment then from the high court to the match court. Um, you will note that in the high court, they refer to a warrant of execution as a writ. It's exactly the same as a warrant. It's just a different name. So warrant of execution and writ of execution, exactly the same thing. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail with regard to the warrant um, of execution because, um, you know, that's uh, fairly straightforward. Read the act and see what you what you must do. It's the same as in the match court. I want to uh, concentrate on the sale of immovable property because there's been a lot of um, litigation with regard to it. There's been a lot of development with regard to it. Um, and there's, a you know, quite an involved procedure, what you need to do on how to get a warrant of execution. Previously, and by previously, I mean pre-2005, you, if you had judgment and you've done a warrant of execution against movables and there wasn't enough movables, you could automatically endorse your warrant and the clerk and the registrar would just sign to it and then you would be able to attach immovables and proceed with the sale. So you had no extra requirements. However, in 2005, the uh, Constitutional Court then said that Section 66 of the Magistrates Court is invalid because what is required because of uh, Section 26 of the, of, of the Constitution, which guarantees housing, is to say there must be judicial oversight before the immovable property can be executed. And that then started with DAFTA, um, um, they brought in, they changed it in, in the um, Magistrates Court. They've actually changed it now in the High Court as well. There's a whole new process. We'll get to that. Um, but you have to bring an application to court to get the court's oversight as to um, the sale of immovable property. Uh, we've referred to Standard Bank versus Saunderson previously, where you need to put in that special paragraph to warn the defendant of his rights in terms of 26, which might be um, violated because of the sale of the uh, property, and he must bring reasons to court as to why his property must not be sold. And so your clerk or your registrar cannot um, issue your warrants anymore. 
um, you must then, as I said, include your prayer and defendants must be informed of their rights. Um, in Magistrates Court, you have Rule 510, which sets out the exact paragraph that you need to put in. And in the High Court, it is because of Saunderson that you have to put that paragraph in. Um, Elsie Goodwana then confirmed, it confirmed Saunderson um, because in Saunderson it said if the bank wants to bring an app, uh, uh, sale and execution, they can do that without bringing an application. The court said no, everybody must bring an application to court to be able to sell your immovable property. The, they have kept the requirement in Saunderson that you need to give notice um, to the defendant with regard to Section 26 of the Constitution, but everybody, irrespective of if it's the bank or the uh, uh, private person, must bring an application so the cause, uh, court has oversight as to the sale and execution of immovables. Um, you know, it's not, I, I think everybody after that then had this idea, let's bring applications to rescind and declare the sales immovable uh, of immovable property to be invalid because there wasn't judicial oversight, but it's not that easy. You still need to show that judgment was granted um, invalidly, and that's not that easy. Um, these effect, for instance, let me just explain to you, in Richard Schloss, which is a Cape Town unreported, it found that um, JAFTA replies retrospectively. And if the warrant of execution was invalid, then the sale of execution was void. And remember this morning I spoke to you with regard to, this, to a service on the grass, and that was the summons that was served on the grass, um, default judgment was taken, they got a they made an application to sell sell the the sale uh, the property in execution. The property was sold in execution. The property was transferred into the the um, new owner's name who bought it at a valid sale. And the court said because right at the beginning, the way you obtain judgment was invalid. It affects everything else, and so your sale in execution and your transfer everything is invalid. So the house falls back to the original data. And this is also what happened in this matter of Markham. Um, Mr. Ming, uh, there was a judgment against Mr. Markham by somebody else for defamation. Um, and he didn't defend that. They got default judgment. The house was sold. The house, um, obviously, this was now, there was no judicial oversight because that was before the requirement for the judicial oversight. The house was in the process of being sold to a second person who's got absolutely nothing to do with the previous litigation. And then Mr. Markham said, hang on, wait, something's wrong. And we got an interdict to stop the second transfer and brought an application then to declare all the other trans the, the previous transfers to be invalid because there was no um, judicial oversight for the sale of the immovable property. And we went to the SCA and the SCA agreed and said this uh, property was sold invalidly and as a result the transfer of, of that property is invalid and the second transfer is also not allowed to go through. Now in this instance, for instance, there was a bond over the property and the first purchaser paid the bond and all the costs involved with the transfer of the house because it was a sale in execution, so the interest and the legal cost. So obviously a lot of money. And the court ordered and said, right, money, the, the house goes back to Mr. Markham, back into his name. But then the court also referred it back to the court, a quo, to then determine who must pay what, who must pay the damages. Because Mr. Markham now received a house without any bond on it. He was now bond three. We previously had a bond, so he didn't have to pay anymore. So you can see there's some equality, inequality happening here. Um, and I can tell you now this matter has never gone back to court. So he, I don't know if he still has the house or, what, or if he sold it, but he got it back bond free. So you can see the consequences if you do not comply with the requirements of, of having the judgment taken um, validly and the sale and execution validly. All right. Just to note that second homes, second um, holiday homes to be sold also need judicial oversight. So the fact that you might not live there or anybody lives there makes no difference. You still need judicial oversight. 
what has happened in the meantime is now that section uh, rule 46a has been brought in it's effective from the 2nd of december 2017 and it now says residential housing you must apply to court to be declared executable so they have now codified it and set out the requirements um it's a long format okay we, when we get to applications i'll explain to you the difference between the short and the long format it must be served on everybody as you can see all that list there and it, it's also a requirement that it must be served on the debtor personally by the sheriff all right so again with divorces this is the other instance where um, something must be served personally you can't serve it on the gate or the under a rock or whatever and in the affidavit you must give the, the court obviously as much information as possible if there's any alternative means that the judgment can be satisfied um, if it's his primary residence who lives there sometimes the plaintiff don't have this information because they don't know but you must give as much information as possible um, and then you need to support the market value the local authority valuation the money uh, owed by the mortgage bond the money is owed by the local authority um, any other factor that may be necessary for the court so wide discretion uh, and in this instance now this is where the court gives a reserve price based on all this information that's given the court is then allowed to give a reserve price and then setting as i said the reserve price the court takes into uh, in consideration all that information that you've given um the problem is if if you don't reach the reserve price and what the act says then is you go back to court and you say to them all right i couldn't reach the reserve price what must i do now so obviously again you can see it's got a cost implication because every time the poor, uh, plaintiff needs to go to court they have to pay for it so uh, it can be quite costly you know after judgment to sell uh, your immovable property um the requirements are set out in rule 46 i'm also not going to go into a lot of detail about this please make sure that you comply with these requirements because again uh, if you don't comply with it, the court will find that the sale was invalid uh, they used to be lenient and maybe if, if you do a little fault here and there it's not the end of the world but now because it's seen as a fundamental right of housing they will protect it and so any mistake that you make in terms of the rules will be used to declare your sale of immovable property invalid so be careful comply rather redo it if you've got a problem if you don't comply with the time frames um, again it must be served on everybody i want to actually what i want to get to i uh, made a little because if we do go through this we'll all die of boredom um, please read it please make again do in the inside of your file do your dates you get a date from the um, sheriff of when the sale is and then work back when you must do when you must do your conditions when you must advertise all right um very while we're talking about advertising we can i'll show you now the credit it gets published in the government gazette and the newspaper in the district which is getting less and less because newspapers aren't getting um published anymore but you can do it online as well you can do it electronically and it must be five days not less than five days and not more than 15 days before the sale all right I'll, I'll explain that to you now let me just get there we go all right so here's our sale our sale is on the 26th of september um it may not be uh, it must be 45 days after the warrant was served so not shorter but there's so much to do that you don't want it to be shorter all right so we, we sort of work back from here but let's go there so then we have a condition of sale that must be drafted and that goes to the sheriff and then there's a couple of time frames where you have time to amend it people have time to comment um, on the conditions of sale those are actually in the rules so it's not a, a contract that you start from scratch it's prescribed but can be changed and then finally 20 days before the time the sheriff settles that um, and then it lasts for 15 days to be inspected and then you advertise 
your notice of sale. All right, basically, that's going to be your ad. So as we said, your ad is 15 days at the earliest before the sale and five days um, at the latest before your sale. But as we said, it must be advertised in the Government Gazette and in a local paper. The Government Gazette only gets published on a Friday. So sometimes this five days and 10 days is less because you need to take into consideration the Friday. Can you see here? I've got the Friday here. So always keep that in mind. So work out your 15 days, which is the earliest, but then you need to take the nearest Friday and the same with the five days, the nearest Friday, so that you comply with it. All right, your notice of sale, you do that 10 days before the time, that also lies for inspection. All right, then all these things you need to send to the sheriff, your, your confirmation of your ads, your notice of sale, your condition of sales, that must all go to the sheriff. And then he has it on the date of sale, should anybody uh, want to see it. But this is not all. It keeps on going. You just think we finished and then we carry on. The sale of execution must comply with the Consumer Protection Act. All right. Now you can see here all the acts, rules and regulations. The green is the magistrate's court with the rules. The blue is the high court and their rules. And then the black is the Consumer Protection Act. So make sure when you do this, it complies with the rules, the sections of the Act, and CPA. All right. Um, Super, Consumer Protection Act basically applies to all sales and execution, but luckily your um, implied warranty does not apply to goods bought at auction. So you don't have to worry that someone is going to come back and say you made a representation and it's it's not correct, it's not adhered to. Um, I'm not going to go through all the regulations. Again, there's loads of them, you'll see, um, and we'll dive for them if I go through them. But please make sure you, you, you go through them, you read them, and you make sure that you comply with them. So these regulations apply to all auctions. That includes um, movable and immovable. Uh, what you need to do is, in your ad, what is extra that is not not in your rules of the court, is you need to do a URL. Can you see here? You give a, an address on the internet where people can have access to the Consumer Protection Act. So um, it's not your own. It can be a government one. But make sure that th they can access it and um, see, you know, what the, requir what, what the, the Consumer Protection Action says. And then the second thing is FICA. So you need to inform them already in the ad that they have to bring proof of identity and address of particular your, your bidders. Obviously, if they don't have it in the ad, they're not going to know how to bring it. So these are two requirements that you won't find in the magistrate's court or high court. This is in terms of CPA. This is just another example of an ad. You can see there's the URL. All right. Um, then you must have this bidder's record, and this is then where your figure comes in, the information is there, you list all the um, bidders, if they're acting on behalf of a company, you must have letters of authority and a resolution, and these records are open to the public for inspection, uh, before, after, and during the auction. And these records must be kept for a period of at least three years. You need to make sure that the sheriff complies with this. Um, just after the CPA cam, came in, they, they didn't know about it and they didn't comply with it. I see these days they are doing it. But as the plaintiff's attorney, you must just make sure that your sheriff that auctions the house comply with all these requirements. Because again, if any of these things are found to be Intercorrect, it can lead to this, the um, whole process being declared invalid. And it, and I don't know if you've ever placed an ad in the newspaper with regard to a sale, but they are horrendously expensive. Um, are they, they're over a thousand rand because I know this is where the the newspapers know they can make the money because you have to advertise. So those ads are horrendously expensive. The one in the government because it's very cheap. It's like thirty six rand. But in the newspaper, over a thousand rand. So you can imagine that's just an expense. Then we're not even with the drafting of the documents. We're not even with the sheriff 
that can charge you a, a percentage of the sale. Um, so you can see the expenses are extremely high. So make sure, again, I keep on saying that you comply with the requirements because you don't want two or three years. And this is what happened with this matter I spoke to with the, you know, the, the um, service on grass. That happened years ago. Now we're coming to the sale of execution. Now they're raising into the defense. So five years down the line, after you, everything was hunky dory, you're now back to square one. So, and obviously, explaining that to your client is going to be very difficult, and the cost involved is horrendous. So, I want to reiterate please make sure that you comply with all these requirements because obviously, if they want to find fault, they'll find fault because there's so many requirements. So, a lot of nitpicking and and the courts as i say are very um poised to rather you know err on the side of caution and assist the poor debtor who has lost his house and they don't think about the creditor that's got had to pay all this money that's irrelevant because the house you know the right to housing is very strong so if they if they can find a mistake they will use it all right i hope you survived we finished. Thank you. This is the email address. You can um, email me and I will send you the slides. And then hopefully I'll see you in a couple of weeks time when we do the second lecture. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.